Hey everyone, how's it going? Cloud here, and welcome to my guide on the Ritual of the Marjorat quest. Now guys, before we begin with the guide, this is quite a lengthy quest, so uh, therefore quite a lengthy video, and this is a direct sort of sequel to the Wild Gothic Sleeps quest, so you can imagine there's going to be a lot of different things to complete, and a lot of enemies to defeat as well, so um, obviously if you need to um, stop during part of the video, it might be worth making a little reference what part of the video you got up to, so you can carry on watching it from where you left off. Anyway, enough about that, on to the requirements of this quest. So, you must have completed the following quest, the Temple at Seniston, Wild Gothic Sleeps, Hazel Cult, Inarchra's Lament, The Slug's Menace, Fairy Tale Part 3, Rocking Out, A Tale of Two Cats, and the Fight Arena quest. Links for all my guides on those quests can be found in the description below. So that's it for the quest requirements, as for the skill requirements you need level 76 crafting, level 77 agility and level 76 mining, um, neither of those can be boosted so you need to have the actual physical level. And you're going to need to be able to fight various high level enemies during this quest and I'll talk about that a little bit later on in this guide as some of them have got sort of specific strategies and that for, um, so I won't worry about that just at this stage now. So that's it for the requirements, now on to the items. So you'll need a ring of visibility, a rope, you will also need a spade, you can acquire one during the quest but the one on your tool belt will not work. You will also need your cat speak amulet enchanted or cramula if you have that. And for recommended items, I'd recommend having an anti-dragon shield or equivalent protection against dragon fire, uh, and also the dig site pendant uh, in order to get to the dig site quite easily. So that's it for the requirements and items, now onto the quest starting point, so we're currently at the Falador Lodestone which can be accessed via the Lodestone network and to start the quest we need to speak to Satifi Kashin in Falador Park and select the Ritual of the Marjorah option and we'll speak to you once we're there. So Satifi will comment that you have good timing and tell you he has an operative on Mosla Harmless who is gathering information on attacks on human settlements and has been asking for assistance. He'll tell you to go to the other inn and ask for Satendif who is undercover and dressed like a pirate. Finish talking to Satifi and when you say you'll get right on it you'll be given an offer to be teleported to Mosla Harmless for free. If you don't accept the offer to be teleported now, you cannot request it from Satifi later, so you have to get to Mosla Harmless the manual way, which will be going by a charter ship or via Bill Teach. So, once you're on Mosla Harmless, we need to find Satendif, and he'll be in the larger of the two pubs dressed like a pirate wielding a dagger. You'll ask if the pirates are planning to attack cities, and Tendiff will show you that pirates are only a threat to other ships. He'll tell you that what he has been investigating is a threat to everything, including fortified cities. You'll be warned that the Mosulahamas jungle is about to become harder to get around, and will remain that way until this part of the quest is concluded. If you say you wish to continue, a screech will then be heard as well as ominous music. So, the cutscene will show flashes of fire outside the inn, and when it clears, some of the pirates outside will be lying injured on the ground. Speak to Satendif again, and he will tell you to look outside to see if anyone saw anything. So talk to all the different injured pirates, and they will vary what they say. The injured pirate to the south will tell you something threw a fireball at him, but he didn't see what did it. The injured pirate to the north will have no information, and other pirates will say they saw giant fire-breathing albatrosses and bony dragons that stood like men and could speak. After questioning enough pirates, you'll think, hmm, I'd best go and check things out. So after speaking with the various pirates, the information you acquire will suggest that attackers flew into the jungle. You'll need to take weapons and armour with you into the jungle as it's populated by aggressive jungle horrors. Satendo suggests you take a look out the gate to see what's happening out there and he will join you as you leave, but a fireball will then hit him and kill him before you can go anywhere. You'll duck for cover on the west side of a tropical tree and you'll then decide to run using the trees as covers. 
So this bit is a particular pain in the ass. Basically, you need to make to the very eastern part of um, this sort of like uh, area, um, using the different trees as a protection. As if you stay out in the open too long, you'll be hit by one of the uh, dragonkin's fireballs, and then you'll uh, basically black out and have to start from scratch again. Now, if you use reasonable dragon fire protection, the damage should only be around 800 damage. Obviously, if you don't have that, it will be uh, a lot higher. So basically, what we're going to do now is try and navigate through the different trees, um, past where the Trouble Brewing minigame is, until we get to the area where a cutscene will trigger. But in order to get there safely, you need to sort of um, run to each tree, stay there for about two to three seconds, and then carry on moving. Um, now, if you've got your music playing, it will sound uh, something similar to the Jaws theme if you're kind of in range of being hit. So what you want to do is while you're behind a tree, if that music is occurring, you want to wait for that music to stop before moving out of cover. So I will provide a little image in this video which kind of details the route you can take to get to where you need to, however it's a little bit difficult. Um, I would just sort of pay attention to the method I'm doing on the screen now, so sort of um, not running too far to another tree and just sort of going a little bit of a movement at a time, stopping for a couple of seconds and then proceeding. Um, it probably will take you a few attempts, I think it took me like 7 or 8 attempts before I actually got it right, um, when I thought I was near the end part. Um, I actually wasn't and ended up getting taken out right at the last minute. Um, like I said, the main strategy really is to take your time and just be careful to um, stay protected behind each of the trees um, and eventually you'll make it to the other side. So once you reach the far edge of Trouble Brewing in the eastern trees, you'll activate a cutscene and you'll see the free dragon kin will be discussing how destruction eases the rage and says that it's still building and that someone must be using it. They decide to attack a larger settlement and they must continue their search for the false user. They will then fly off and you say you must report back to Sisyphe Kashin. So what we need to do now is return to Falador Park and speak to Sisyphe Kashin, so I'll speak to you when you're there. So once you speak to him, you'll tell him what you saw, and he will take you to the Temple Knight Archives, where you'll meet Lady Table. Lady Table will produce a dossier on the Dragon King. The dossier will have a note from Robert the Strong, and saying that the Stone Toucher must take the collar from his reincarnation and use it to get to Kefsi as a puzzle key once they get there. So tell Lady Table and Satifi that Robert reincarnated as a cat named Bob and that you've researched this for an early adventure. Also tell them that you think you're the Stone Touch because of what happened during your previous mission from them with the Stone of Jazz. Lady Table will tell you to go find Bob and get his collar. So you want to exit the archive via the door to the east and Satifi will then teleport you back to Falador. So this next part, you need to use um, the Cat Speak Amulet Enchanted in order to track down Bob. Now this will be similar to what you've done in the uh, A Tale of Two Cats quest, if you can remember that. Basically, the Cat Speak Amulet um, works as a compass. The two whiskers can be clicked to rotate the triangle in the centre clockwise and counterclockwise and keep an eye on the point of the triangle. Um, once it's in the right way, the light will... Um, the eyes will light up and the cat amulet will sort of move and that will indicate that's the direction you want to head in. And then you want to try teleporting somewhere in that general direction to get closer. Now Bob's location is different for everyone because he can move around RuneScape where, um, like everywhere um, but he is often found around the Death Plateau area so starting in Burthorpe might be a good shout and then going from there. Once you eventually find Bob, ask for his collar and he'll provide that to you. So now we have Bob's collar, we need to head to the ruins of Kefsi. So what we need to do is uh, find access to the ferry ring system. Obviously, because you completed Fairy Tale Part 3, you won't need to have um, the fairy staff with you, so you can just automatically use any of the fairy rings. Um, the one I find easiest to get to is to teleport to Yanil Lodestone, and there's one shortly north from there, if not Edgeville Lodestone is a close one as well. So we now need to use the fairy ring to travel to the destroyed realm of Kefsi, and the code that we must dial in will be found on the reverse side of Bob's collar, which is DIR followed by AKS. So 
So once you've done that, you should arrive at Kefsi and you'll begin exploring with the aim of finding out the motives behind the Dragonkin attack. In order to do this, you must collect the four tetrahedrons found scattered around the Isle of Kefsi, which together form the crest of the overwhelmingly powerful Dragonkin. So once you arrive, head northwest and begin searching the rubble at the north of the island, which should give you the item Tetrahedron 4. Next, go southeast and up on the ramp nearby onto the first floor of the destroyed building. Now go north and use Bob's collar on the wall design, and you'll need to position Bob's collar correctly into the pattern of the wall design in order to open a concealed compartment. And this is done by positioning the collar vertically with the bob side facing up in between the centre right and far right piece. Once the collar is in this position, which I'm showing you on the screen, uh, you must then move it up until it slots into place. You will then receive five items, two notes, a note to Robert the Strong and a note to you, a tetrahedron one, a statue arm and Robert's necklace. The necklace plays no role in the quest and can be banked the next time you're at one. So staying on the same floor, go south and jump across the ledge to the west and then use the statue arm you acquired from the hidden compartment on the statue with one arm, a spire will then fall. You want to cross this spire and then go down the ladder in front of you. Head east and up the wall jump shortcut which you can run up. Once up, climb the wall to the west, followed by taking the swing pole to the north. Walk across the beam to the east and then jump over the gap. Go south and jump from the floor on south, and then go down the ladder twice. Now squeeze through the pipe to the east of you. Mine the rock side that is blocking the path to the north. And then climb up the wall in the north and run across the two walls to the west. You can fail at these obstacles and you'll have to navigate your round uh, sort of near the previous bit to get back up to that uh, level. Next you want to go across the handholds and they're very similar to the Brimhaven Agility Arena. Then go down the ladder, go north outside of the building and then east and search some rubble for a strange device and a tetrahedron free. Go back up the ladder twice and then jump from the floor to the south. Slide down the roof to the south and then go south. Take the spade that's beside the stairs if you haven't got one with you and then walk across the plank. And then search nearby rubble to find the final piece of the puzzle, the tetrahedron 2. So after you've found all four tetrahedrons, go back across the plank and go down the stairs. Once you've used all your tetrahedrons on the indentations, you'll receive letters 1, 2, 3 and 4, which make up a four letter code. The code will also be listed in your quest journal. You'll now have to roam the plain of Kefsi and use the strange device to find the location that matches your code. Now the code is different for every player, the coordinates start in the southwest corner of the world, uh, which will be known as AAA. Uh, and it goes right up into the uh, very far corner. So what I will do, depending on what your code is, is where you'll need to use the strange device. So if you see the image I'm now being displayed, it basically shows a grid on how these coordinates work. And the ones that are marked in orange are obviously all the possible coordinates that you can obtain. And you basically need to find your way to that area. And then once you're near enough uh, at the right spot, you then need to start using your strange device. Once you've found the correct spot, dig there with a spade and you'll find a Kefsian key. And now you want to go back to the dungeon of Kefsi, which was in the middle of the western island where we um, obtained the code in the first place. 
So once you're back there, go through the southern door and search the southeast bookcase for a scroll. Read the scroll to learn a new spell, Tune Bane Ore, and then search the bookcase west of it and read the journal. So now we've done that, we need to return to Falador and report to Satifi Kashin with the journal. So he will read it and the information will worry him a lot and he'll suggest you visit Idria, Farisk and Akrasay in Falador's castle. So we're going to head in that direction now and you should remember where they are from the Wild Gothic Sleeps quest in the little room together. So speak to any of the three and tell them what you've discovered from Daphna's message. The dragon can grow more powerful as the power of the Stone of Jazz is used. And now that Lucian is using the stone a lot, the dragon can will may become powerful enough to destroy Gilanor. Idri will be very concerned and as always, Akrasay will be very sceptical. Suddenly, Ali the Wiles will show up and contribute additional information. His research and knowledge of astronomy have pointed out that the Marjorat ritual of rejuvenation is about to commence. This appears to be another problem, but Ali is able to make a plan out of it, since Lucian will definitely be using the stone act of the ritual, and several other Marjora have the desire to dispatch him, you may ally yourselves with them to counter the combined power of the stone, the staff of Armadil, and Lucian. Akrasay will want convincing that having the aid of the Marjora is necessary, for he believes all of them are as evil as Lucian. So what you need to do now is choose these following dialogue at options. So instead you'd risk all of our lives. I can't think of another way. Yes, we will have to be careful. And I will risk my own life to negotiate. So the group will decide to try and get some of the Marjora themselves to help in fraught in Lucian and you volunteer to investigate the ritual site first. Akrasay will give you four tele orbs uh, to try to teleport the Stone of Jazz away during the ritual. Ali will give you Arav's heart which you must use during the ritual to break Zimorgul's control of him. And then finally Ali thinks that Azandra may be their closest ally so you should visit him first. So we need to head to the Sentistan Temple and talk to Zorazandra and that is located underground of the dig site and you should remember that from the Temple at Sentistan Quest. So the easiest way to get there is if you have the dig site pendant you can teleport directly to the dig site. If not, um, teleport to the Varrock Lodestone and then head in that direction until you get there. So, ask him about the quest and he'll be surprised you know of him attending the ritual and assumes that Ali must have told you for a good reason. You'll tell him of the proposed alliance and he'll reveal that his spies have informed him of Lucian's possession of the staff but that he himself is not familiar with the stone and you'll briefly explain it to him. So, Azandra has stored some of Zaros' power in four beacons which he asks you to place at a ritual site with the northern, southern and western and eastern ones facing each other to be able to use this power to defeat Lucian. You'll get the beacons and then say goodbye. So you want to make sure you've definitely got these items for the next part, ring of visibility, rope, all of the items from the previous step, four tele orbs, Arav's heart and four beacons. So we now need to head to Gorok, the site on which the Ritual of Rejuvenation will take place. Now the easiest way to get there, and you should remember this from the Temple at St. Eastern Quest, is to teleport to the Fremenic Province Lodestone, and then keep walking north until you find a canoe within the Trollwise Hunter area. Uh, this will then take you to where uh, Jahalan was frozen, uh, and then you can walk past the ice block into the Gorok area. So 
So after arriving at Gorok, go east and squeeze past the ice block and climb over the pillar in the southern part of the courtyard near the red line on the minimap. After climbing over the pillar, there is a tunnel in the ice covered wall. Climb through it and you're now standing on the Ritual Plateau. So to save ourselves some time, we're going to go and quickly collect a heat glow which we will need for the Finding the Stone of Jazz part of this quest. So in order to find the heat glow, we need to enter the Temple at Seniston dungeon part as we did during that quest. So to do that we need to go east and climb down the stairs, climb up the handholds next to the door, go past the smash pedestal and jump down the wall at the next corner and then enter the trap door, but be wary of the powerful ice fiends. So enter the room to the west and run south, there is a heat globe lying on the ground in the small room. So you then want to take that and return to the surface. So now we have the heat glow, we want to return back to where the uh, ritual plateau is. So once you're there, what you need to do is make sure you avoid the undead broavs that wander the plane. If one sees you, a wizard will appear and teleport you to the cell in Zamorgul's fort. You can lift a tile at the east of the cell and then dig a hole to get out. So what we need to do is place several items which will aid our allies in the battle around the ritual site. So what we need to do is place the beacons in the north, south, east and west area. We also need to store Arav's heart and we also need to put a rope in order for the allies to gain access to the area. So for the northern beacon, if you run west from the ice entrance at the north of the plateau, you need to place it on the closest tree. The southern beacon, you want to run directly south from the north one and place the second beacon in the tree southwest of the ritual stone. If this is done correctly, you should have a message saying that the south beacon is opposite the northern beacon. The eastern beacon is near where Movario is in the southeast corner. Uh, head north from him and place it in the first large tree you see. And in the western beacon, you want to run directly west of the eastern tree and place the final beacon in the large tree positioned between two smaller trees. So you want to make sure the beacons are correctly placed, uh, two on two of the sides. On the third and fourth beacons, if you place them and it's correct, you'll receive a message saying that the beacon you place is also in the direction of the other beacon. If you receive a message saying it feels right but it's not placed in conjunction with the other beacon, then you know it's not quite in the right spot. With your rope, you want to go to the northwest corner of the plateau and look for an overhanging tree, which is a tree that cannot be chopped down. It is the closest large tree to the cavern. Use a rope on it to create a rope climb from the beach to the plateau, and this will be used in your, uh, by your allies to climb to the ritual site. From now on, you can also use this rope yourself to get between the canoe landing site and the plateau without having to go past uh, the dragons around Gorok. So for Arab's Heart, you'll find that a short distance north of the southern beacon tree is a ritual marker. Place Arab's Heart in the rocks which are several paces south of the marker and a pace east. So we're now going to head to Zamorgul's Fort which is due west of Mavario and southwest of the ritual site. Once you arrive at the castle, kill the armoured zombie outside the main entrance at the south end to gain a code key for the main entrance and some decoder strips. So this particular bit is very similar to um, the Curse of Arav quest when you entered Zamorgul's fortress before and had to use obviously the decoder strip. So read the code key and it will provide you with four letters. So my decoder strip was AEDE. -E. So what you need to do is open the entrance and what you want to do with the interface drag number one over uh, the first letter so for me that was A and that provides a number which is six then using the buttons you want to select six and then go on to the next slot. So then use your stri uh, second strip and put that over the second word which for me was E and provides number three and again do that with the interface. And the same with number three, you put that over the third uh, letter, which was D in my instance, and that provided me with the number seven. And again, use that for your third option. And then with your fourth strip, you want to use that on the fourth letter of your code, which was E. So um, obviously I had to remove the second strip first and then put the next one on, and that provided me with number four. 
Once you successfully do that, the door should then be unlocked. So once it's opened, go through the door into the main room on the ground floor and search the crate that's just north of the eastern weapon rack for a storeroom code key. Read this code and then use it to open the storeroom door which is to the west and it will be in the same manner as the main entrance was opened. So once you're in the storeroom, search the crates to get another code key and the heart magic notes. Read them and it will reveal that the further Zamorgul is from Arav, the stronger his resistance will be. Thus he made a prism from glass to strengthen his grip, but it failed to function. In the Karamcha Volcano, Zmorgul found some obsidian, out of which he made a working prism, which he hid in the fort to avoid the clumsy zombies breaking it. So now we want to go into the main room and climb the stairs to the west and walk through the hallway. You'll see Zmorgul and his gargoyle locked in a room on this floor, stand in front of both of the locked doors and in turn you'll overhear them discussing their plan that the zombie army is full strength and Arav is in position. As you walk back, Zmorgul will say he spotted the intruder but it turns out it's just him practicing a speech. Go up the eastern stairs and use the new code strip to enter the reliquary. Once inside, smash the black stone in the south of the room, and the black stone is the black prism that the note's speaking of, strengthening Zamorgul's control over Arav. And once you're done in the fortress, we can now exit it. So now we've done that, we need to go speak to Mavario in the southeast corner of the plateau. Now be careful not to get caught by the undead Broavs, as they patrol this area and can stop you in mid-conversation, so you may have to talk to him more than once if they get close. But eventually he'll learn that he senses the stone of jazz is nearby, hidden somewhere, and he also senses shadow magic. While wearing the ring of visibility, run west along the south side to find a normally invisible shadow pedestal. It is deactivated and thus you need the heat globe which you should already obtain from earlier on. So put the heat globe on the pedestal and a nearby wall of ice will melt revealing an entrance in the southern rock wall of the plateau. Now, if you're not fully prepared for the upcoming fight, you want to return to the bank and prepare before entering, as dying during the upcoming fights will place your gravestone out of Gorok near the entrance to the ritual site cavern. Now don't forget, we have set up the rope so you can get to this area quite quickly by obviously using the canoe from the Fremenic uh, province lodestone and then climbing the rope to get back up to this ritual site. Now I mentioned at the beginning part of this guide there's obviously going to be a lot of enemies to defeat and they all have different weaknesses. Now I've found personally going for the magic um, approach is the best as most of the enemies have some form of weakness to a magical element uh, and it also enables you to fight sort of long range then. So um, I would go obviously with your best magic setup, bring enough runes to be able to cast all different elemental spells and obviously uh, best a magic weapon and shield um, or the book if you want to do dual cast. And of course make sure you've got plenty of food uh, and stuff with you as well. So when ready you want to enter the cavern. Now if you tried to put the heat globe on the shadow pedestal and it said it could be a good idea but you've got other things to do first. It means either the beacons are not aligned properly, Arav's heart has not been placed yet or you haven't talked to Mavario after smashing the prism. If you're completely sure the beacons are in the correct alignment, talk to Mavario again and then try and do that. Another method that some players have done as is remove the beacon from the tree and then put it back and that's also then worked. So once you're ready for the fight, pass through the entrance you opened and you'll be in a large ice cavern. The passage to the east is blocked by an energy barrier that cannot be passed at this time. Go down the other passage and the stone of jazz will be there and you want to touch it to trigger a vision of the past like during Wild Gothic Sleeps.
So after the cutscene ends, you'll find out touching the stone has triggered an alarm and you'll be teleported outside where Satifi is waiting alongside Akrasay, Ali the Wise and a battalion of Temple Knights. According to Ali, the ritual has commenced and the ritual plateau is flooded with fighting Marjara. You'll head for the ritual site but suddenly be intercepted by General Khazard and six elite Khazard guards. He'll reveal that Ali the Wise is actually the Marjara of Wahisatul, much to the fear of Akrasay who will suffer a panic attack. Wahisatil will convince you to stay calm and that General Khazard will then proceed to attack you. So after the cutscene ends, General Khazard and his forces will be fighting you. Khazard will use a long range magic attack which can be blocked with protect from magic or deflect magic prayers. You're aided in this fight by Satifi and the uh, Marjara Wahisatul who will aid you in attacking Khazard and several temple knights who will attack the minions. During the fight your combat stats are boosted significantly by your contact with the Stone of Jazz. Now periodically through the fight, Khazard will summon his Hellhound Bouncer who will constantly inflict small amounts of damage on you and you cannot attack Bouncer. Now what you need to do is lure him over to Wahisatul who will then kill him for you. Um, it is also possible to lure Khazard over to Wahisatul so whenever Bouncer is summoned it will die instantly. Now most of you shouldn't have any trouble with Khazar, but if he is proving difficult it is possible to hide behind a tree and let Satifi and Wahisatul defeat him themselves. So once General Khazard is defeated, he'll teleport away and you proceed to the ritual site, finding it strangely deserted. Wahisatul will then sense a nearby Marjara, he steps forward and calls for General Khazar to reveal himself, but instead Lucian appears. After taunting your group, he summons four enchanted ice titans. Satifi will call Idria via the Comet Orb and request, and request reinforcements. The immediate arrival of a support group of Guardians of Armadil signals the beginning of the first battle against Lucian's forces. Now throughout the battle Lucian will duel Wahisatul but, no, but will eventually cast a spell at you. If it hits the ground where you're standing a pillar of darkness shoots up that deals several hits of a thousand plus damage each. When you see a smoking black skull flying towards you, you want to move at least two squares away from where you're standing and continue to attack the Ice Titans. If an Ice Titan freezes you before you can evade Lucian's spell, you can be hit for massive damage, so make sure your health is up. Do not attack Lucian directly as he'll hit you for over 4,000 damage. Two of the enhanced Ice Titans will head for you. Turn on Protect Melee or Deflect Melee and attack them. The Titans have higher life points, but Protection Prayers will help against that. However, they also have a special attack that encases you in ice, and this works similar to the cocoon attack of Araxor, which you can break free by rapidly clicking the ground around you. If you do not break free of the ice quickly, it will shatter and you will have significant damage done against you. As the titans are quite large, try to position them such that one is attacking you at a time in order to reduce the number of special attacks used against you. Now you can only deal damage to two of the ice titans heading for you, attacking the other two results in no damage and they will attack you even if the weapon or ability hits. Tiffy and Akrase will take down the ice titan faster than Idria and the guardians of Armadil. So after Lucian's enhanced ice titans are defeated, Wahisatul will taunt him, after which he will summon 20 level 140 ice demons. Wahisatul is now scared and says they'll need help, but then the Marjorat Sliske appears and summons the Barrows brothers to aid in the fight, and an enraged Lucian orders his army to attack, and another battle begins, and two of the ice demons will then come after you.
Now the Ice Demons use magic and ranged attacks, the magic attack being stronger, so it's advised to use Protect from Magic. Occasionally they'll throw icicles that grow on the ground around you, which will block your movement. Now one strategy to beat them is when this fight starts, don't move from your current position and let the Ice Demons come to you so you have enough room to see Lucian's attack coming at you. The two demons will also get a little bit split up as well which will enable you to then focus on one instead of having to worry about both of them attacking you at a time. Other than that it's just a case of obviously attacking the demons as quick as you can and making sure you heal and avoid Lucian's attacks. Once the Barrows brothers are done killing the ice demons they will then help you kill the demons. So once the ice demons are killed, Lucian will grow tired of your attempt to stop him and turn to a more important subject, the ritual of rejuvenation. At this point, multiple Marjorite will teleport, including Inakra, who believes that her rival Afankos uh, should be sacrificed in the ritual. Also, Zimorgul, Azandra, and General Khazad will appear and argue over who will be sacrificed. Hazel will also appear for players who chose to revive him during the Hazel cult. Lucian will decree that as he is the most powerful Marjorat, he alone will decide who is sacrificed and pulls the frozen Jarlan from the cavern beneath, choosing him as the sacrifice. Wahisato well, will protest, claiming that Lucian must be sacrificed due to the threat he presents. Another battle will then begin, Sliske will summon the Barrows brothers for the second time, but Zamorgul counters this by calling his gargoyle minion, who will then summon some armoured zombies. You then need to help the Barrows brothers defeat the armoured zombies, who will focus on the Barrows brothers and will not attack you back. So Morgul will then order for Arav to be summoned, who will then engage all six Browers brothers at once. So your job here is to attack Arav while evading Lucian's dark magic as before, until he turns his attention to you. And then you need to lure him over to the rocks to the south where you planted his heart. Once he comes close enough to it, Arav will break Zamorgul's control over him, move around and watch as the hero of Varok will then viciously turn on his former master. So after a little while, Zemorg will plead for Lucian for aid, but when Lucian ignores him, Zemorg will call for everyone present to attack him. While every other Marjorat present turns on Lucian, Azange will tell you that the southern beacon has broken and that you must repair it in order for him to call upon the Bower of Zaros and end the battle. Lucian will retaliate by calling a level 160 Glacial to stop you. Now you've got two choices at this part, you can either turn on Protect from Range or Protect from Magic and gather the four pieces while avoiding the Glacial. Assemble them by clicking on one piece in your inventory and then place the beacon back on the tree. At this point Lucian will call for the fighting to stop. Alternatively you can also use this Glacial as practiced by killing it and the Glacial has the same drops as a normal one located in the cave below after the quest is finished.
so Lucian will stop the fight and performs the ritual rejuvenation, sacrificing Jalen's life in order to renew every other Marjorie. Being stronger, Azandra will then strike Lucian with the power of Zaros in two massive damage attacks. While the attacks deal enormous damage to Lucian, um, he will shrug them off, claiming he merely felt them. In response, he summons the Stone of Jazz and touches it, which will amplify his power. But before he can use it, the three Dragonkin appear and proclaim Lucian to be the false user who they will destroy. Idria will attempt to bargain with the Dragonkin and convince them to enter an alliance against Lucian, however as a demonstration of their power, the Dragonkin will incinerate her instead. Lucian will then attempt to fight against the Dragonkin, but eventually Lucian will be disarmed and then um, is knocked to the ground and the Dragonkin picks up the staff of Amadil and stabs Lucian from behind. The Dragonkin claim to feel slightly better now and make a threat to destroy the world and then will fly off. Inarkara will then teleport away, followed by Athankos, Haziel, Khazard, Zamorgul and Azandra, leaving you, Satifi, Akrasay, Wahisatil and Sliske behind. Sluskate is impressed by your skill and tries to convert you into a Barros brother, but Akrase jumps in the way, saving you and becoming a Barros White himself, Akrase the Doomed. Sluskate seems content and quickly teleports away. Despite your suggestion to keep the stone as a nice garden feature in your player own house, Tiffy summons Tarisk, who with the help from the player and Sir Tiffy performs a mathematical spell, placing the stone deep underground in an unknown place and you then all teleport away back to Valador. However, rather than returning to Falador, you'll enter a burnt down version of Drainer. As the three of you run forward, Dragonfire will incinerate Farisk just after he thought he saw Idria. And indeed, Idria, Girardel, and Normal are all standing there, but when each of the heroes are approached, they retreat and exclaim, We're already dead. Going further will lead you to Lucian's body with Curadel crying next to it, as well as another deceased hero, this time Hazelmere. In the next alley stands Sloane and Akrase. Follow him to the bank where suddenly the Dragonkin appears and after a short chase scene the Dragonkin hit and kill Tiffy and wound you. They will then let you go telling you this is a vision of the future.
You return to Falador and Satifi doesn't really collect the dream as you two. Nevertheless, he's pleased that Lucian is dead and rewards you. However, after the quest, Edgeville will appear to have been attacked by the Dragonkin, just as they stated in the vision. It will then come up with congratulations, you completed the ritual of the Marjorat quest. You're awarded three quest points, 110,000 agility experience, 40,000 crafting and mining experience, three 80,000 experience lamps, which can be used for skills level 72 and higher, the ability to use Bane Ore, the spell Tune Bane Ore, and the ability to fletch Bane Arrows and Bane Bolts, access to the spell Storm of Armadil, and the ability to create Armadil runes, access to a new Barrow's brother, Akrasay the Doomed, and his equipment. Access to the Glacials um, by using the code DKQ. After entering the Glacial Cave, the Stoner Jabs will give the player a 3-6% to 6 damage bonus in the surrounding area. Access to the Marjorat Ritual Site and the entirety of the Morgul's Fort. Returning to the Ritual Site and speaking to a Rav near the location will grant you 3000 Prayer Experience. Access to a Bloodwood Tree south of the Ritual Plateau. Completing this quest and the fate of the gods unlocks rune dragons through the world gate, two treasure and the keys and two hearts of ice. So there we are, quest complete. So overall a very very lengthy quest as I did pre-warn you at the beginning of this guide, however a very good quest. So um, obviously Wild Graphic Sleeps I completed a little while ago and I've never been able to complete that quest on my main account uh, due to uh, complexity so I was quite looking forward to doing this quest as well as there's quite a good uh, amount of lore and battles in this, quite a sort of interactive quest. And the rewards from this are pretty decent as well, um, obviously a lot of XP and access to things like the Glacials are very good. Now again most of you will probably be completing this quest in order to uh, unlock the full rewards for the uh, Fate of the Gods quest and the World Wakes quests and also the One of the Kind quests. So once I have the requirements to do those fully I will be uh, making a guide on them which you'll find in the video description below so make sure you check that out. Overall though, I don't think you'll run into any problems following my guide, however if you do get stuck leave a comment in the comment section below and I'll help you out as best as I can. If not, thank you for watching, please make sure you like, favourite, comment, subscribe and don't forget to share with your friends. Cheers everyone, bye bye.